Welcome to The Swing of Things with Amanda Krause, a brand new podcast hosted by me, Amanda Krause, and produced with Row360. In this episode, I'm joined by three Paralympic athletes who will represent U.S. rowing at Tokyo 2020. Charlie Nordeen is a two-time world silver medalist in the PR3 Mixed Cox 4. Tokyo 2020 will be his first Paralympic Games. Hallie Smith is also making her Paralympic debut at Tokyo. She competes in the PR1 Women's Single Skull and is a World Championship bronze medalist. But first up is Blake Haxton, the US PR1 Men's Single Scholar, who is also competing in the Para Canoe. Blake, thank you for joining us today on The Swing of Things. It's it's wonderful to have you on. Hey, thanks for having me. For those people who don't know who you are, I would say that most people in the rowing world know about um, know about you and, and know your story, Blake. But, you know, as we chatted a little bit about before we, we started recording, this is a story you have told many times, um, but I think it's important for people to have to have context of what you what you went through um, to, to actually get here right now. Um, like you said, started rowing freshman year of high school. I think it's pretty common. I mean, a lot, a lot of people on the team have that same story. You know, you, you know, rowing, very few people do it before you get to some sort of school, uh, high school, college level. So I started out as a freshman, had a bunch of friends do it. My mom wanted me to try it out. Um, said I'd give it a go. And Good did. job, mom. So, yeah, right. Um, that one, that one had a hilariously large impact on my life. <laughs> but yeah, but it was great. I, you know, but just did great fit, really enjoyed it. Uh, rode for three and a half years in high school, right up until I got sick. And so it was March of my senior year. It's when I contracted what they call necrotizing fasciitis or the flesh eating disease. Uh, unfortunately, it's about as bad as it sounds. I got on my right leg and pretty quickly things went from, from bad to worse. Um, it's a big, long, long story of me getting sick. But the, the upshot was um, they had to amputate both my legs in order to keep me alive. And uh, that everything worked, thank goodness, and and then uh, took about three months in the hospital, and then got out, and still graduated from high school, so was off to college. I lived, like I said, I've, I've lived here in Columbus since I was a kid, so um, went went off to Ohio State for school. Which that was fall, great. Blake, did you go straight in as planned that September? I did. Wow. I did. I started right away, which, in hindsight, I probably would not do again. Uh-huh. But to be honest, honest I didn't realize you know it'd been six months since I gotten sick or, or so and I felt a lot better than I did but I didn't realize how bad a shape I was still really in to tell you the truth so um but you know it gave me something to do and, and something to, to think about so that was that was positive on the whole and it worked out um but yeah that I mean that was probably those first two years of college were really just focused on on recovery and and getting better and I, I it, starting out I didn't know again how bad things were and how much I could improve and then sort of got back into the swing of things and got, you know, no pun intended, yeah, and got back into work. To life and right. And, uh, and figured it out and, and just kind of figuring out what the future would look like. And, and then when I graduated from undergrad, I, I decided to go to law school at Ohio state. And I was also just growing up a little bit and maturing and said, okay, I really haven't worked out regularly or that hard for the last four years. You know, I lift a little bit, but that's mm-hmm. about it. And I need a really good way to work out. And especially for someone in a wheelchair, the, the ERG, you just can't, you can't beat the, I mean, able-bodied people can't do much better than the ERG, but um, especially for when you don't have a lot of other options, the ERG's great. So I bought the ERG seat, uh, put it on the ERG. That was really frustrating for a while because you're, you're breaking down muscle memory and, and things like that. But really glad I did it. That proved to be one of the better decisions I made. Um, and then pretty soon my ERG scores were low enough to try out for the U.S. team. And, uh, and so I entered Crash B's, uh, the indoor championships that year and, and won those and had a pretty good time. And so then the U.S. team reached out and encouraged me to try out. I thought, OK, well, uh, it, truth be told, I wasn't really ready to get over missing rowing, I think. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, I, I think there was a whole lot of other stuff tied up in that. You know, I knew it wouldn't be like it was before. I knew that rowing arms and shoulders was going to be very different than rowing in an eight or a four, even if it's just a high school boat, but those are just entirely different disciplines. And that's all true. Yeah. Um, that, that was, that was an accurate prediction. Cause you hadn't been in a boat right since high school and since you'd gotten sick and I mean, very, very, exactly. very sick, major recovery. You jump in, you row in the, in crash bees, you win. You hadn't been in a boat though. No, right. Okay. No, at that point I had not been back in a single at all. So what was that like? Um, when you first, 
got into that single and, and you sort of, you, you hinted it a little bit that that transition from. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's funny, we did change the name of the event. It used to be arms and shoulders single, and now it's PR one. That's um, right. Ellen Minzer was telling me about that. Okay. Yeah. So there's been a whole, whole thing about that. So you know, it was funny. So when I got back in single, I, I got back in, I had a few buddies who I rode with in high school that were back around in Columbus and helped me out. And help me out is an understatement. Couldn't have done it without them. And my old high school coach was here. Uh, actually, a couple of old high school coaches. Pat Kington, who's my coach now, was 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 around, and he was, um, you know, instrumental. But it was it was kind of fun in the sense that when we when we got this gut seat, got the boat, you know, sort of you know ironed things out. And actually, I've never sculled really. I think I sculled twice in high school, so that was an adjustment. <laughs> wow. Um, so I was learning that. And I think that actually helped because it, it truly was something new that I wasn't, mm -hmm. wasn't having to adjust from. I was just picking up, mm -hmm. but we all found, but we don't, everyone involved had been around rowing for a pretty long time. I mean, you know, high school coaches done it for probably 40 years at that point. So we thought we knew enough and we found out pretty quickly that in, in subtle ways, the able-bodied stroke just doesn't translate to the single doesn't or arms and shoulders. It's just not, it's not quite the same in a lot of ways. It's not just um, take out the legs and just use the arm. It, right. Okay. That's it's exactly right. It's uh it's not rocket science, but it's it, it does require some you know adaptation and, mm -hmm. and a little thinking about it a little different way. One of the big ways you really can't rush the boat for the rowers listening, you don't know what that means. Um, you can kind of throw your throw your weight around and because you're strapped in up to the chest, you really can't influence the way the boat runs. So it is, it's actually a pretty good strategy to just rate up as high as you can uh -huh. and get back in the water and don't worry about taking a hard catch or anything like that. So that was something we, we kind of learned instead of that long, you know, smooth rhythm we all kind of search for in a rowing boat. Yeah. It just didn't really matter anymore. Um, yeah. What is yeah, the so rate? Got, like, what are you, what are you, what's your race pace? Like, what are you at? I try and keep it over a 40 um, the whole time, but which I know is not astronomical by a lot of rowing standards, but if you look at the ratio of recovery to drive, it's like two to one uh, uh, drive to recovery. Um, you can just, you know, you can snap your arms out pretty quickly yeah. and then pry the boat through it. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't feel at, like you're being all that efficient. It doesn't look that way either, but uh, it's, it's the fastest thing to do. Okay. Um, so that was a big learning curve and that was kind of fun because we got to figure out something new. Yeah. And did you know, I mean, so that first time you got in the single, were you thinking about, you know, the Olympics, the Paralympics, or were you thinking about, were you thinking that far ahead or were you just thinking, I'm just going to get in a boat and see how it goes? Um, yeah, I think I was thinking that far, well, maybe not Paralympics far ahead, you know, right. that was, so this was probably a month or two before trials for the 2014 world's team. Okay. And the only thing we were worried about is getting a boat that was a boat and a seat that were together fit to row down the river. And that is a lot harder. So at the time, WinTech was really the only company mm -hmm. making seats. And this is a lot of details, but I just broke the daylights out of that seat. It wasn't very well built. Um, it's, it's just not very sturdy. So I have a friend here who's a fabricator. So he ended up custom fabbing me a seat mm -hmm. that's, that's about, it's, you know, got a lot of aluminum on it and it's very, very strong. Yeah. So we, we had to figure all that out. So it was, it was a couple of us with some very long nights at the boatyard, just trying to get things patched together. That was the biggest concern because we all had the view, I think, and we kind of knew where I was relative to everyone else in the country, like uh, erg wise, at least we had an idea. And if, if there's ever an event where ergs float, it's the arms and shoulders single. Uh, like it, it translates very close. And this was even back when we were only rolling a thousand meters. And when the rule was you had to have the pontoons contact the water so that that rule has since changed you can have them upsize you want but i mean it really was they were trying to set it up as as foolproof as possible so um anyway all that took a lot of some of the took a lot of the variation out of it so um, we thought okay i've got the strength and i've got the the fitness yeah and we just get a boat that works um and we figured it out nick a time and then and then iron that out and then i really started looking forward i think at, at the world championships in 2014 I really, I, I mean, I was just happy to talk about just happy to be there. I was just happy to be there. Yeah. Uh, Literally. Really? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, I couldn't believe it. Like I was, I was just, it was on un, unreal that that had happened. Uh, and, and, but then I, I came in fourth and that was also surprising. Um, and, and at that point it was like, oh, this is, 
this isn't sort of the exception now to maybe what I want to be doing going forward. Maybe this is just going to be a part of my life for as long as I can do it. Uh, and, and came away from that. It was, and I mean, I, something I didn't foresee at all as, as probably a lot of the roars, maybe, maybe they don't know, you know, in world championships, in non-Olympic years, the para team and the able-bodied team are all at the same world championships. And they're just, you know, you're just all in there together. And, which was really cool one because i hadn't been on a team since high school yeah of any kind really and then two like i like i knew who these people were you know like i remember we got there and uh, uh my coach knew a bunch of these guys but like i think it was ross james walked in one of the james twins was uh, we were like unpacking our luggage and, like he like knocks on the door he's like hey what's up pat how you guys doing <laughs> i'm like this is awesome <laughs> this is so cool that's pretty uh, great yeah. So anyway, it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, and I got, I got kind of hooked and then, uh, and that's the rest is kind of history, been on the team since. Yeah. So Rio to so fourth in Rio, fourth in Rio. Right. Okay. All right. So you know, what question is coming next, of course. So, you know, what are you, what are you thinking about now for next month in, in Tokyo? Um, and, and what is the competition like in this, um, PR one single? And for those who haven't sort of caught on at this point, the PR one single is now, um, legs, uh, sorry, arms and shoulders right yes that's well a, a, no well well so that that's actually so this is actually the answer to to the question you just asked is how's the competition and where do you think you're going to place i was seventh in 2019 so 2019 worlds i was seventh at the qualifier got the last qualifying spot skin of my teeth and i was very happy with that mm -hmm. um a couple things have happened right after rio they switched from 1k to 2k which i think was a great decision for a lot of reasons. Um, they deregulated a lot of the strapping and the equipment, including the pontoons. So, you know, the, the para singles have pontoons under the riggers that keep them more set, ideally, or keep them from flipping. And you used to have to have them touch in the water, now you don't, um, which was great because it makes it more of a rowing discipline. But they also, part of the reason, and this is a, yeah, no, it's not a cynical take. This is exactly what happened. People kept complaining that there were athletes who were not, rowing with just their arms and their shoulders in the event. And don't you think that's a little unfair? And so the solution that FISA came up with was we'll just rename the event and not worry about it. Uh, so what happened was between 2016 and years afterwards, and you can watch, you can watch it in the results. You can watch it in the film. It's, I mean, that, I'm not, this is not some conspiracy that I'm, I'm spouting here. It's, it's consensus among the, the sport. What they did is they got really tired of having to regulate the strapping rules for what part of your body you could pull with and which one you couldn't. And there were problems with that and they weren't that well written. So I, like, I certainly understand that. And behind all of this is something that's common to just about every Paralympic sport, which is classifications, very, very hard. Mm -hmm. Classification is the process of defining which, which disabilities compete against which. And of course there's this tension between we wanna have a pool, a large enough pool of athletes competing to have it be meaningful, but we don't want such a small, pool of athletes that it's purely determined according to who's the most able-bodied at this thing. So that's, I mean, that, it's, 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 a, it's a tough, exactly. It's a tough nut to crack. So anyway, the, what, what Rowling did is they said, we're going to leave most of the classification up to the, what they call the medical classifiers, which basically says you get a doctor's review and a referee's review on what your disability is or supposedly is. And that will determine which event you're in. And then we're just basically going to let you do whatever you want in terms of what you do in the boat. So as that's happened, the field has really stretched out. Um, it's not, the racing is not, is not tighter at all. And it's much more predictable. So that's a very long way of answering your question of, if I, if I was seventh, I'd be pretty happy with that. I think, I think somewhere between seven and nine is probably where I'll end up. Okay. Um, okay. Again, because the gaps are pretty big and they're pretty hard to overcome. Just backing uh, up for a second, Blake, are you, are you saying that now once you're placed in a, in a specific category, all bets are off in terms of the, the strapping and the, I mean, you can, you can do one, whatever you want once you're classified as PR one. Yeah. For all intents and purposes, that's, that's the case. Okay. Um, and there were, all, you, there were always ways, not, not easy ways necessarily, but there were ways around it before where you could, you know, people would have a, you know, have a strap that was loose or have a strap that was too low. Or, and that, that part of the reason was that was not a very good way. Originally, they legislated it by saying your, your strap has to be so tight and it has to be so high up on your body, which in theory is fine. 
but again, there, there are ways around that. And even if you're not swinging from the body, having connection through your legs into either pads under your hamstrings mm-hmm. or, or a foot plate mm-hmm. is, it makes a huge difference. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, anybody, anybody that sits on an erg, you know, just sit there and roll your arms and have your feet in the shoes and then take your feet out and put them on the floor and try and take the same strokes. It's just not, yeah. I mean, it's not even the same. It's very, very different. Um, so anyway, that's and like that, to ma- answer maybe the next question, my, the thing I've argued for or wanted, and this is entirely selfish, but I also think it would make it a better event is just take the foot plate out. Like, huh. you know, like if yeah. I, I could, I could put an able body, if I could put you in, I could put any able body drawer in my seat with a chest strap and just take the foot plate away. And no, it'll never be perfect back to the line drawing problem, but it's pretty close. Huh. And okay. anyway, that's, that's kind of in my approach of, all right, well, and we also have this problem. So they almost did that a few years ago because they said, well, if people are, especially people who are paraplegic or higher injuries, why do we really want to be strapping their feet into a boat that might flip? Uh, yeah. So that, that's a question that never really resolved itself. But anyway, um, here I am, here I am complaining. But the, uh, Here you are though, representing the United States. It's amazing. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the medals are pretty much spoken for. I think the the order of finish is pretty much what it's going to be. Um, and I'd be very surprised if there's a lot of volatility in that. But still amazing. I mean, to be going there and and, and competing, I, I'm sorry that it's happening in the midst of COVID. I know um, it's certainly not going to be the same experience yeah. if, if we weren't in the midst of COVID. Um, but you're also competing in the para, is it, can, it's canoe. Yep. Right? Yeah. So they... They call it like they call the whole thing para canoe, but canoe and kayak are kind of attached to the hip, is what I found out. So uh-huh. sometimes people wear the kayak, sometimes they wear the canoe, yeah. sometimes they even do both. Um, but the whole the whole like discipline is called para canoe, and I am in a canoe. Which the big distinction is the canoe has a one sided paddle, so there's only a blade on one end of the paddle, and the mm-hmm. kayak has a blade on both. All right. The joke in our family is that um, people would often say, uh, you know, oh, rowing isn't that like kayaking and um, you know, and I would always, oh, no, 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 it's not, not quite. Um, it's very different, but <laughs> obviously they're the same family. Um, but yeah, they're related. <laughs> yes, they are. Now, is that a, is that an issue in terms of the, the schedule? Or are you going to be sort of bouncing back and forth or? So no, actually. Well, so one of the nice things is they do race it on the same course or mm-hmm. well, they race it on the same body mm-hmm. of water. They don't race it on the same course. The, the canoe and kayak lanes are not as wide and the course is not as long. So they do actually have to relay the buoys. So there's no, then they don't want to do that on a day-to-day basis. So there's three whole days off between the end of rowing and the beginning of canoeing. So okay. it actually works out pretty well. All right. That's good. What are you thinking about? I know I'm not supposed to officially ask you this. So this isn't official, but you know, what's next you have, I know you're a lawyer now, but not working as a lawyer. Um, Right. What do you, are you going to be hanging up your, your oars and your paddle or you don't know, or will you coach? Will you, where will rowing be in your life after Tokyo? Do you know? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I'm not really at a place where I want to be. So I'm definitely going to keep going with the canoe. Um, I had a lot of fun there. I had more success there. Um, it's not as much of a commitment for a lot of reasons. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's only 200 meters, so it's oh. a 50 second race instead oh, of 10 like minutes. Oh, I like that. Okay. Oh yeah, it's oh, it's great. Sounds good. It's great. Sign me up. <laughs> yeah, right. It's great sport. Um, and and it's it's also more competitive in the sense that the the classification system doesn't doesn't work to my disadvantage. So um, that's nice. Uh, the other thing with rowing, I mean, I you know, I've gotten I've gotten more out of rowing than rowing's gotten out of me, but. Uh, you know, at this point, like I say, I was seventh place in, in 2019, which was the last qualifying spot, mm-hmm. given the way things have kind of gone. I just, and I, I think I'm actually getting faster. I think I'm a better rower today than I was six years ago, but, um, it doesn't look like I'll be able to either make, even make, you know, make a, make an next Paralympic team or, or be competitive. So, uh, that's a big commitment to kind of know that there's, there's sort of this, this hurdle that I'm probably not going to get over. So mm-hmm. I don't know if I'll officially retire because I'll still be competing in the canoe and, and that's great, but I, the, I, I strongly suspect this will be my last go around. Okay. All right. But we won't hold you to it either way. I appreciate it. <laughs> I know you have an, a, a brother who's slightly older than you are. It sounds like you two were, were close. I don't know if you still are. Um, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And then, so who will be, you know, cheering the loudest for you, uh, back at home? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, I think my family is, is going to be, 
you know, I mean, they'll, they'll be ecstatic. They're thrilled. Um, all of them. Uh, you know, I've had, I, I could go on and on. I've really been fortunate. I mean, I, I, I say this a lot, but I won't name names. They're probably tired of being embarrassed, but I just have a lot of people around me that make this possible and want me to go fast and want me to succeed. And, um, and that's not necessarily why they do it. I think they do it because they know I enjoy it and, and it, you know, couldn't do it without them. And, and that's, that's awesome. But they definitely want to see me win or see me, you know, succeed, you know, do well. Yeah. Um, and Hey, look, I mean, it's, it's the Paralympics, right? Like this is not, you know, this is, this is the big time and you want to root for the United States. You want the United States to win. So I think that plays a big role. I think it'd be, it'll be fun to see. I think for my, in terms of people that I would love to uh, get to see me, you know, do well, um, Pat, my, my coach is probably up there, Pat Kington and, mm-hmm. and Chris Schwartz from high school. Cause they knew, especially those guys, I mean, they've known me for 15, you know, they've coached me for 15 years wow. and coached me all as an able-bodied athlete as a young guy and watched me grow up from mm-hmm. you know, novice and depart, like got to see the whole thing stuck with me while I was sick. And then when I wanted to get back into it, we're like right there and ready to go. Yeah. So they've been, I mean, they've, they've literally seen it all from day one. Wasn't it one of those coaches who was when you were in a coma or about to be in a coma? I mean, things were not looking good. Um, and I know I heard you talking about your brother was, was, was flying in and, um, to say oh, goodbye. Yeah. And then you tell the story of how <laughs> your coach called to say, like, I hope you're not trying to get out of practice. Like, we'll see you back on the water. Which, which coach was that? Oh yeah. Oh, that was, that was Chris Schwartz. That was, uh, <laughs> you know, it was the old, the old high school varsity coach. Yeah. I mean, it, it hit everybody so hard and so sideways that I think, and it was, it's been strange too, in some ways for me, because, you know, I, but my, like my experience of getting sick was, you know, well, you know, Saturday night, my legs sore Sunday. Okay. This is getting worse. Monday, I go to the hospital and Monday afternoon, I sort of pass out and don't, don't come back around. And then Tuesday morning, I have a moment of clarity, um, which having talked to some, some doctors and people who've been around traumatic injuries before was probably what they call like the pre-death surge, where you get like a jolt of energy right, <laughs> right before you check out. Um, and I remember them saying, hey, we're going to go into surgery and see what's wrong with your legs. We don't know yet. But that's it. That's all I've got for six weeks. So all of the really, really ugly stuff, like I just wasn't that I was I've been told all this after the fact. I mean, I, I just don't wasn't there for it. So um, a lot of all that is to say the people around me went through it in a way I didn't. Uh, and and so they've got their own experiences and stories when when things were really, really bad. Yeah, um, yeah, of course. And yeah. So, anyway, and then, so anyway, they were all there and that'd be, that would be pretty, it'd be pretty cool to get to uh to get to 60. And it is a bummer that, you know, COVID's done what it's done and people can't, you know, can't go and can't, can't see it. Although Pat, uh, I lucked out, Pat, I, I, he agreed to hang around for, be the coach for canoeing and, and run, which is great because he writes the training plan for both of them. But, um, so we'll get to be there and be there in person and that'll be, that'll be really nice. Oh, good. Good. Okay. So, I mean, you, you have a lot of fans and I know we'll, we will all be cheering. Um, I, I have a question that I ask of, uh, everybody who comes on the swing of things. So, you know, I'm going to all ask right. you, what's your, uh, what's your go-to meal when you're getting off the water from, from a row, you know, you're, you've been going, you're hungry. Yeah, you don't oh, have to make um, it yourself. That's the rule. I, that's the, you know, what I always point out. It, don't limit yourself by you have to actually come up with this food. What's your go-to? Okay. Well, that's good. So, um, so the goat, if I have to race again, it's chocolate milk. It's hard. Really? To... It was, like, oh, sorry, yeah. but ew, wait, then you're going to race again with that chocolate what, milk in you? What? Well, well, <laughs> ra- like maybe not race immediately, but like, you know, for days, days in the future. Oh, oh okay. I was picturing like, like, and then in the hot afternoon heat. Oh yeah. No, no, no. Well, it all, yeah. Like it's not warm. That's like I said, we're, I'm not preparing it myself, but in terms of just getting something that you can, you enjoy, but you can also keep down and get you the things you need, yeah. sugar, some protein, fat, whatever. That's fantastic. And I can, I can keep it down pretty well. Um, if it's not, 
if I don't have to race it after trials in 2016, we went to Waffle House. Oh, and that was no. that was that was grand. Who doesn't love I mean, Waffle House? I mean, I haven't been in a really long time. I don't know if it holds up. Um. Well, I mean, it's an experience for sure, <laughs> especially depending on where you're at. Yeah. But that's kind of the I spent I spent a lot of time in Waffle Houses and a lot of the, yeah, that's not one you like you you finish your semifinal and you know go throw throw down a couple waffles that's not the right move there but um that's probably what i would seek out if if i knew i didn't have to keep you know going the next couple days i respect that that was a good answer this is one of my favorites oh good yeah it's it's i mean you know you know what you're getting every time you sure do want to get it or not it's debatable but you know yeah (laughs) you sure do i don't know if you'll be getting any waffle house in tokyo but you can you can have it to look forward to and i just so enjoyed getting to speak with you and thank you it's very kind have admired you from a distance and will certainly be 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 cheering for you and um you know of course selfishly hope that you keep growing for a really long time or at least stay involved with the sport so we can um you know keep you inspiring the next generation Well, thanks so much. That was Blake Haxton. Next up, I spoke to Hallie Smith. Hi, Hallie. Welcome to the Swing of Things. Hi, thanks so much for having me. And where are we talking to you this afternoon? I am sitting in my apartment right now in Brighton, Mass., just a neighborhood in Boston. Yes, yes, I know it well. I've actually lived there. It's It's great. Five minutes from the (laughs) boathouse is the perfect place for me. So let's talk about you and, and, you know, who you are and and where you're from. And, uh, you know, I I was obviously reading and learning about you prior to this conversation and never having rode before. When did you first discover the sport um, as an, as an athlete? Can you, can you talk us through that a little bit? Yeah. So I actually rode one season in high school, able-bodied rowing. Uh, it was my uh, sophomore year. I was not very good. Um, <laughs> just to throw that out there. And then I switched school, so I didn't keep rowing. Um, and I actually rediscovered it in January of 2016, um, a little less than two years after I'd become paralyzed. I was at the National Rehab Hospital in D.C., they had these Saturday workout classes where you could just come in and do free weights. There was some structure as well, people there to help you. And Patrick Johnson, who coached the NRH team, came up to me and was like, you look strong, come try rowing. So I did, and I was good at it, which I really liked. <laughs> um, and about two weeks after that, I did the Mid-Atlantic Erg Sprints in Northern Virginia. And I won, what was it? The time AS and is now PR one. Okay. And being good at something made me very excited and happy. So I just kept going with it. So you went in and won just a few weeks after beginning to row. Yes, it was not. (laughs) It was funny at the first mid Atlantic erg sprint. This was when it was one K. So my first one in 2016, I did a 633 1k and then the next year in 2017 I won with like a 450 1k or something so my first 1k was not very good but it was a small competition and it wasn't very heavily competitive that year do you still have the world record in the in the 2k for the no indoor? I don't I have the world okay. record for my age group technically but someone the French woman uh, broke it. Okay. Uh, so you, you you still have a world record though? Technically. It doesn't feel as good though when it's just the 19 to 29 age group rather than the overall. So my goal is to break her record. How, how far off are you? Uh, I haven't done an ERG 2K in a while, so I'm not sure, but that's kind of my goal for post Tokyo. I love it. Okay. Maybe we could just back up a little bit and talk about the event that you're in for the listeners who aren't familiar with the many, many rowing categories we have. Um, but can you can you talk about the PR1 single? Yeah, of course. So I am a PR1. There are three what are called classifications in para rowing. And a classification is basically how much your disability affects you or kind of how disabled you are. And the 
higher the number, the less impaired you are. So PR3, they row with their full bodies. They used to be called LTA, leg, trunk, and arms. PR2 used to be called TA for trunk and arms. And PR1, my classification, used to be called AS for arms and shoulders. So basically, anybody in my category, we have a little bit, we have impaired abdominal function. So we have a chest strap that we wear. And it's because if we didn't have that, we would all just fall on our legs and never be able to get up. Um, so you've got a lot of paralyzed people or like my male counterpart on the national team, Blake Haxton has really high up amputations. So he is also a PR1. And the only event that we have is the single. So it's, I'm PR1 women single. And what was the, the first time you went from the erg into a boat? <laughs> You'd been in a boat before, right? Because you had rowed a little yeah. bit in high school. Um, but getting into, um, as a para-athlete for the first time, getting into a single, what was that experience like? So it was really different in general because I'd never been in a single. I had never been in a skull. I had only done sweep in high school. Um, but also it was definitely scarier uh having less control of my body i knew i could swim so there wasn't like an oh my gosh i'm gonna drown but balance is more difficult when you don't have a lot of ab control and of course you're strapped in in all these different places so you know everyone has their feet strapped in but i also have a strap over my thighs around my hips and then over my chest um so it was a little overwhelming, kind of all this stuff that was different, but it was definitely exciting um, because it was something that I could do even though I was paralyzed and it was something difficult and different that I could do. It wasn't just the stuff you learn in physical therapy that's like, you know, relearn how to get in a car or relearn how to turn over in bed. It was something new and exciting, which was really important to me um, at the time. I, as I said, I'd been paralyzed for a little less than two years at the time. And rowing really gave me a sense of independence again. I've, I've seen that with the, the para athletes. I've, I've had the pleasure of working with it through row New York is just exactly what you said that, that independence of, of getting out there. I, I know you said at one point that you feel like crew saved your life. Um, can you talk to us about that a little bit? Yeah. Um, it was really hard, um, becoming paralyzed. I was 19 or 20 when I started having trouble walking. Um, I have a genetic disorder called hereditary spastic paraplegia. So I don't have an injury. There was never a point where I was just like, you know, perfectly able-bodied one day and then paralyzed the next. It was a process. I walked with a cane, then used a manual wheelchair some of the time, had to use it more and more. And I was truly paralyzed about a month after my 21st birthday. And it was really, really hard. Um, I went to the Mayo Clinic a few months later and uh, was told I would likely never walk again. Um, and <laughs> that was told to me on, I was there for two weeks as an outpatient. And they told me that the first Friday I was there and then my mom and I went into Minneapolis, went into the Mall of America, and I cried in the Mall of America because I was overstimulated and it was hitting me that I wasn't going to walk again. So a little bit of a disaster there. Uh, but um, yeah, it was really difficult feeling like I wasn't going to be independent and there is so much focus on what I couldn't do. And, you know, I saw amazing paralyzed advocates and athletes and all this stuff, but I felt like I wasn't there. And there can be this weird feeling as a disabled person of like, I'm a bad disabled person because I'm upset 
at being disabled or something like that. Like I still sometimes feel that guilt if I'm frustrated about something. Mm -hmm. Um, but anyway, I was, I felt down on myself a lot. And then rowing really gave me something to feel good about myself for. And I remember talking to one of my teammates in DC who was a veteran who'd been uh, blown up in a tank. And both of us had really struggled with depression and self-esteem and things like that until we found rowing. And for both of us, it gave us community and a sense Mm of, I am good at something, Mm -hmm. especially physically, which was really hard to find for a while. Really good at something. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Really, really good. Yeah. And I, I mean, hard would be, I think would be, is an understatement, right? I think. (laughs) Yeah. Um, that's a very valid word to be using. Well, tied to that, I'm wondering about, you know, you were ready for, um, you won a, a bronze in the single in 2018. Yes. Was that right? 2018, which is incredible. And then, um, you know, 2019 came, then we're in, you're ready for Tokyo, what you thought would be 2020. Um, and then COVID came. Were you able to go out and, and train at all on the water? Not on the water. You... Um, okay. The high performance program at CRI, as when COVID hit, um, one of the coaches delivered ergs to everybody's house or apartment. And I did not go on the water at all in 2020. I'm immunocompromised. And so we we're like, it's just not safe, even with other, you know, it's just not safe, even yeah. with all of the precautions, with masks, just everything else. So 2020 was, I mean, it was a hard year for everyone, let's be honest. Right. And things are still hard, even though it's slowly getting better. But yeah, it was a really difficult year in terms of training as well, just because, you know, I train on the ERG. I know it's good for me. I know that it makes me faster, but it's nowhere near as fun as being on the water. Not the same. <laughs> just not the same. Exactly. Who, so who motivates you? Who, who's your biggest motivator, Hallie? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I would probably say my coach, Jenny Sitchell, she uh, coxed the four in Rio and won a silver. And she pushes me so well. Like every practice, she knows just how to push me to keep me going. And so she's really helpful. Even before she only became my coach uh, this year. But even before that, we would get on Zoom and she would be, you know, doing a walk around her neighborhood and I would be rowing on the erg. And it was just a good way to have someone to keep going with. Yeah. Sometimes that's all we need, right? Is somebody next to us. And just to kind of keep you accountable, like, Uh because there's days where you're like, oh, I don't want to do this. But if you say, okay, I'm going to get on Zoom at three with you then you have to do it. So it can be really helpful. Yeah. Something to be said for that. And who do you, who do you train with now on the water? So usually about once a week, I train with my teammate, Jennifer. She raced the PR2 women's single against Maddie. Um, it was a really good race. They were less than two seconds apart. I don't think I met her, but she's that sounds, a that's great close. motivator uh, on the water. So we will go out on Fridays a lot and just be pushing each other in pieces. Um, so I start a little ahead of her because she's PR two and fast Mm -hmm. and I'm PR one and fast, but have less function than she does. So it's a really good way to race someone. And even when I'm not on the water with someone to train specifically, uh, if we see another boat Jenny will tell me, okay, don't let that boat catch you. Keep in front of them or try to catch that boat. So that's kind of one of the things I love about the Charles is there are always other boats to kind of push myself against, even if they don't know that I'm racing them. (laughs) They don't need to know. Exactly. (laughs) It's a lot of activity there. 
And then speaking of being on the Charles and, and being at, I know you're at CRI. Um, and you said you're going back to coaching post Tokyo yes. and who will you be who? So this is a two part question. Who will you be coaching there? And then how does being a person, um, a rower with a disability, do you think affect you or, or influence your coaching style or approach? So I don't know who I will be coaching yet. In the past, I've coached adult general suites, which is people who, you know, they already know how to row, but they're not super competitive. That's a really fun group. Mm -hmm. I yeah. have done both adult and youth learn to row, which is also just a blast. Um, yeah. So I'm hoping to get kind of those groups again, maybe some crew league, which is the uh, youth who have gone past learn to row, but aren't necessarily on one of the teams yet, or they aren't on one of the teams yet. They're not novice or varsity. It's kind of that intermediate, that step between. and. Being a rower with a disability, it can make it a little tougher. I have to explain things verbally a lot more. And I often will, especially in learn to row, I will grab an able-bodied coach to demonstrate the rowing stroke or something like that um, just in those early days. But usually it's only the early days where I really need someone to demonstrate. And after that, you can do a lot verbally. CRI is really great. And they actually helped make a special seat for me that I can sit in the coaching launch or on one of the barges for Learn to Row. There's a little go-kart mm -hmm. seat that I can snap in place so that I oh, can sit great. safely. It's really cool. Um, and... Yeah, it's not easy to do some of the things. And a lot of the times I'm telling them to do something that I know is right, but I haven't really done, or I only did when I was 15. So mm -hmm. it can be a little weird, but I really enjoy it. And I think that the, the people I coach kind of enjoy having like a, an international athlete for a coach, even if. I can't demonstrate or don't really know the feeling that I'm telling them to get. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure that they appreciate that and the success that you found in the sport. Um, and the fact that you, you're able to just have someone demonstrate, you know, it should look like this. I think a lot of coaches, um, are still working on that themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, the value of being able to say, look at my arm, like it should, your arm should be up here. Look at mine. Exactly. Um, you know, there's real, like, instead of just using our, our voices as coaches and our words. So, and speaking of being an international athlete, you know, you're, you're going to your first Olympics. It's, it's going to be a unique Olympics for sure. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> with, with COVID and, um, you know, what are you most excited for there in, in Tokyo and what's your, what's your goal, you know, when you're on that race course? Um, so it's hard to know. I don't know how much they're going to be letting people go to other events because that I was really excited about that. Um, but it's really hard to know how much they're letting that happen. Cause I was excited to see, I love wheelchair rugby. And so I was like, I'm going to see wheelchair rugby. And now I'm like, Hopefully I can see wheelchair rugby, um, yeah, but it yeah. will be nice. I loved seeing the women I compete against. Um, you know, I see these same women every year and it's really great. Um, and I'm excited for like the opening ceremonies to be a part of something that big. It's the Paralympics are the second largest sporting event in the world right after the Olympics. So it's going to be wild to be a part of that, even if it is a very weird year. Uh, with them. And then I really want to push myself on that race course and try to medal. It's a tough group to go against, but that is my goal. Yeah. I find myself staying up entirely too late now watching the Olympics yep. uh, happening in Tokyo. I don't know if you're doing the same. Yeah. I have to force myself to go to bed so I can be up for yeah. practice, but yeah, I will like <laughs> wake up in the morning and while I'm still waking up and getting ready, I'll have it open on my phone to watch things. So mm -hmm. doing the same thing. So much fun. Yeah. It's so much fun to watch. 
So a couple more questions. One is, you know, having found so much success in the sport yourself, what advice do you have for para rowers who are, who are just starting out, maybe thinking about what you were going through and, and thinking about when you first became a rower again? Um, I mean, is there any advice, you, you know, yeah. you wish someone had maybe shared with you? Definitely. I think that one of the big things is don't get discouraged if it takes you a little bit to get used to it because once you figure out the stroke and how your body works, if you're practicing a lot, you will improve by leaps and bounds after a certain point, but it might be a little hard for the first, you know, few weeks or months. But once your body kind of gets used to it, you will definitely see improvement. And once you start getting the technique, uh, once you're on the water, because, you know, the erg is where you're going to start learning your stroke. Mm -hmm. And you'll see improvement there once you get used to it. But on the water, once you start getting that technique, you'll really see it. And also just don't be scared. You know, you've got a coach with you. You've got people there for your safety. So yeah, it's going to be a little wobbly, even with, mm -hmm. we have pontoons to stabilize our boat. It can feel a little wobbly with them, but it's really hard to flip with pontoons. And I flipped once and it was okay. Uh, so oh, you have flipped I with pontoons. I always flipped. wondered if it was possible. It okay, is. you've proven that it is. Um, but it, <laughs> it was okay. And so I think that really just pushing past any fear you have when you're in the boat makes a big difference. That was like I always wondered if that was possible. I also once argued it was impossible to sink a training barge, but um, I have done that <laughs> as well. Well, I haven't, I haven't flipped a single with, with punches, but I have, have been on a barge actually at CRI that sank a really long time ago. That's kind but of as impressive. I said, it's not possible. Well, it was an older model. Ah, uh, gotcha. <laughs> um, okay. So one question I ask people at the end of, of every conversation on this podcast is, you know, we rowers, we like, we like to eat. Um, and so what, when you're coming off the water, what's your go-to favorite meal? Mm, I really like, um, a meal that I grew up eating that my mom makes. That's a Chinese meal that is chicken and broccoli with a fermented black bean sauce and then some rice on the side. It is the perfect meal. You've got your protein, your veggies, your carbs. And it's a really nostalgic meal for me too, because it was my favorite when I was a kid. Oh, is is your mom Chinese? No, my mom is from okay. Kentucky. I have no idea how she <laughs> found this recipe. <laughs> I love that. Good for her. Yeah. Um, She's a great cook. And, so and <laughs> I grew up eating well and she taught me how to cook well for myself. That's wonderful. You might have one of the healthiest answers so far. Ooh. Feel pretty of all the rowers. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you're strong and you, you make healthy choices. <laughs> um, Hallie, I just, I want to thank you so much. It's, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you. And I know I'm not alone in saying we will all be, all be rooting for you in that single going down the course in Tokyo. So good luck to you. Awesome. Thank you so much. It was great to talk to you. And finally, I spoke to Charlie Nordeen. Hi, Charlie. Welcome to the Swing of Things. Hi. Yeah, thank you. I'm really excited to be here. So you just got off the water. How was your row? It was good. Uh, yeah, just kind of the usual steady state in the afternoon. Uh, just meshing with the boat. It was a lot of fun. Oh, good. Is this, we're in two-a-days territory now? Definitely in two-a-day. Been in two-a-days territory for a long time now. Okay. Um, it's good. It's good. I like it. Very nice. How early is the morning? Uh, we try to launch at seven. Oh. So usually get to the boathouse by six. So getting up by like five ish. Ooh. Okay. I was going to say yeah, very I civilized, can... <laughs> but as soon as you said five, I think that's not civilized territory. Yeah. It gets a little, or I just try to get up to eat and then plenty of time to stretch and warm up and stuff. So Good. I kind of do it to myself. But... <laughs> <laughs> Good. All right. Well, it's nice to meet you and I'm excited to talk to you and, um, our listeners are going to be, you know, really happy to, to hear directly from you as you're gearing up for the Paralympics. So let's talk about you a little bit. Um, you, I didn't know this, you're 6'8". 
Yeah, can... six foot eight. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So do people ask you uh, what sport you play when you walk into restaurants and things? Oh, uh, all the time. And everyone always wants basketball. basketball That's like the answer they're looking for. Yeah. And then I say I row and they're kind of disappointed. Yeah, no one's ever <laughs> excited about that. <laughs> no, especially I went to Gonzaga University and they have a really oh, yeah. strong basketball team. So people would see me out and be like, we're in Gonzaga stuff. Did you play? And it's like, no, nah, I rode. And like, oh, oh, I don't really want to talk to you right. anymore. <laughs> yeah. Conversation stalls out. Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. But you were a runner before you became a rower. And were you a distance yeah. runner? Yeah. Yeah. I was a distance runner, uh, kind of cross country and then distance track and field and stuff. Okay. Great. Great. And you had planned to run in college. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. And so then for those who don't know, um, your story, your journey here. Uh, can you, can you take us through that? Yeah. So, um, I was a cross country and track and field runner in high school and was definitely like really, really focused on trying to go D one. Um, and that was kind of a big goal for me all of high school. That was a big part of my identity. And then the, towards the end of my junior year of high school, um, we were up in, uh, Tahoe doing like a, a training trip and I was on a rope swing and the rope swing broke before I was out, um, over the water. And I ended up falling about 30 to 40 feet. Um, and because it broke before I was, I was out over the water. Um, I landed on kind of like the rocky shore, right, be right before the lake and ended up basically shattering my L3, L4, and L5 vertebrae um, that then as the bones shattered outwards, partially severed my spinal cord. Uh, so it was a rough day. <laughs> was, this is on a training trip for track? For running, right. yeah. Um, we were out on, we were supposed to be running and we were kind of out messing around. Oh, we were, I, it I didn't was know on that part trail. of the story. Uh-huh. So there was yeah. more to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did it to myself. No, it was, uh, yeah, because we were just out on a run, so we were kind of out, mm -hmm. out in the woods. Um, and we'd known this rope thing was there, and we'd been on it before, yeah. and it was just it was just fun. Uh, you know, you're in high school, yeah. and you're with all your teammates, just having a good yeah. time, and just really, really unlucky. You know, it's kind of one of those things that could have happened to anyone, mm -hmm. and I, it just happened to be me. So Wow, okay, so what what next? Yeah, so they kind of immediately rushed me to the hospital um, where I also broke my wrist in the fall. Um, so that was kind of the big, the concern was I was having a hard time feeling my legs and couldn't really move them at all. Um, and right away they were like, okay, this is a spinal cord injury. And there's pretty immense pain in my back. And I was like, I could have told you that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but I mean, in all seriousness, I was just horrified. It's one of those things like the moment it happens, you just know, you know, you knew it's how like, bad I, it was. yeah, like I've, I've done something really bad because yeah. my kind of first memory after falling was just kind of instinctively being like, I need to get up. I need to move. And I kind of went to start to get yeah. up and my light they just weren't moving and they weren't under me. And it was just the biggest, like, oh my God, you know, like it was kind of in that moment that it clicked and it was like the just immense pain in my back and then not being able to move my legs. I was like, oh my gosh, I, you know, I, in, in the moment I was like, I'll, I'm going to be in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. Yeah. Which was, you know, as, as a 16 year old, it was a pretty crazy realization to have. So they took me to the hospital and they performed two reconstructive surgeries on my back. Um, they did, they weren't really sure how bad it was at the time. Um, they just knew it was broken. So they took me and put me under kind of cut me open and saw just basically how destroyed my lumbar spine was. Um, so gosh, it was like, like a 10 or 11 hour surgery to start rebuilding it. But then they didn't know it would be as bad as it was once they went in. So they were worried about keeping me like under anesthesia for that long. Um, so I kind of came to and was like partially sewn up face down. And they're like, Hey, this is what's happening. We need to let you kind of like come back for a little, and then we're going to put you back under and finish. So there's probably like an hour 
in between Mm -hmm. of, you know, the two surgeries, uh, they ended up putting kind of like rods that lined my lumbar and went up into my thoracic spine to stabilize everything because my neurosurgeon, uh, his name's Dr. Castor, Castor Mori, um, he knew I was so young and he didn't want to fuse any mm-hmm. of my vertebrae because I was still growing, um, which I'm forever, forever thankful wow. for. Uh, so they put steel rods in, which basically immobilized probably about a third to half of my low back. Um, and those were in my back for like two. Yeah. A little over two years. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, and then that was kind of the easy fix in a way. Like the bones were like, put that back together. They're going to heal. The real long-term kind of battle was the nerve damage. Um, because, you know, at, between the trauma and then the extensive surgeries done in the area, it caused a ton of swelling within my spinal cord. So although there was nerve damage to specific nerves, the amount of swelling was putting so much pressure on my spine that basically all the nerves below it couldn't really function at all. Um, so for gosh, almost a month, uh, I really wasn't able to stand. I wasn't able to walk. I could hardly move my legs at all. And it was one of those things where, cause doctors know so little mm-hmm. about, um, like spinal cord. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like one of the, last that in the brain that doctors still don't know science doesn't know a lot about so i'd ask again it's just like a kid i was like tell me you know tell Mm -hmm. me i'm gonna walk again i was still thinking like i have my senior year of cross country i need to get recruited to go to you know like at the time it was like i i have plans like this isn't this this doesn't happen to me right you know like this this happens to someone else not me Mm -hmm. um and they were just kind of telling me like I think it'll come back. You do have pretty extensive nerve damage. We can't tell you that. So those, those are probably the worst times where, you know, all of a sudden like the back is fixed. There's not another surgery to go fix the nerves. Um, and being stuck in a wheelchair and like having to adapt my whole life to being in a wheelchair, um, because I couldn't really move my legs. That was, that was definitely the worst. Yeah. You didn't know what the future held in terms of mobility at that point. Exactly. You know, having those conversations with people and with yourself of like, you know, is this what the rest of my life is going to be? You know, I have my whole life ahead of me. This is, this was not in the plans. Um, so I mean, it was, it was really, really tough. And I was in the hospital kind of during this whole time, just kind of living, um, living at the hospital. Uh, uh, and slowly, but surely as like the swelling started to go down and the nerves became less compressed, um, some like muscle movement, especially my left leg started to come back, which was just so encouraging. I vividly remember being able to move my left big toe. And that was a huge deal. Everyone was freaking out. Cause it meant that there was like There's an intact nerve okay. exactly running all the way down. Um, so that was huge. People were so excited. And to me, I was like, what? <laughs> this isn't Guys, exciting. This is, <laughs> this, this is terrible. Like, I'm not happy about this. Moving yeah. my big toe shouldn't be a huge achievement. But in a way, that really set the tone then for the next two, three years of physical therapy, of like just slowly getting these things back and relearning how my body moves and relearning how to recruit muscles to do what I want because it was such a slow process of everything healing and of, you know, I remember taking my first steps again, like learning how to walk again, learning how to tie my shoes, like bending over was so tough because my whole lower back was immobilized. Um, Yeah. So at this point, you weren't thinking one day I'll, I will be an elite athlete representing the United States. No, in right. No, not, okay. not at all. I mean, yeah. Uh, and that's, it's kind of one of those things now looking back on, it's really easy to connect the dots looking back. Like you can't connect the dots in the moment. Like that was one of the mm-hmm. hardest parts with so many questions. Why did this happen to me? What, you know, I don't deserve this. Uh, looking back on it now, it's like, 
it makes perfect sense. You know, that's what started. I mean, cause I was a good runner, but I wasn't going to go to the Olympics, you know, <laughs> like I was, yeah. I wasn't going to make the national team. Um, so yeah, it's, it's brought me here, which is insane. <laughs> So let's talk about then you, obviously you finished high school, you're off to college. And I read that you were walking through campus and of course being six, eight, you get asked, you know, do you want to try rowing? And I love those stories, you know, what's rowing. Okay. Um, how, how was that transition having been a runner then, you know, getting into a boat? What was that like for you? And was it, was it different? I imagine it was, but I don't want to make assumptions from other novice you know, other young men walking onto the novice team. Yeah. I mean, it was the most freeing kind of experience of my life. Um, because I had never rode before, which all throughout my life with the nerve damage, I could compare, like, I used to be able to run faster, jump higher, lift more everything, right. Even just walking. Um, I never rode before. I had no, previous self pre-injury of like, Oh, this is what I used to be able to go on a 2k or whatever. Um, so it was freeing. It was incredibly freeing. And yeah, there were, you know, challenges, especially the first year, not really being at, I could deal with a lot of back pain just because the rods. And that was kind of always the questions of like, well, can you do this? And I was like, I'm going to try, you know, I, I fell in love with it so quickly that I didn't want. Did the coach know that you had rods in your back at that point? <laughs> yeah, that was kind of, did one you of wait the... to tell them that <laughs> I didn't want to like, you know, mess it up. I didn't want to freak them out. So I kind of, went through the whole orientation thing in the first week or so. And then I was like, okay, I really like this, but like, you know, at some point they're going to see me without a shirt. Like I need the, you know, the big back scars. Uh, so yeah. I told them and, uh, Mark Voorhees, uh, was a novice coach and just an incredible guy. Uh, and from day one, he was just like, okay, like we can make this work. You know, he never, never said no. He appreciated that it was going to, there were going to be extra challenges just because of the nature of what I was dealing mm -hmm. with. And, you know, he always supported me through it, always pushed me in like a really healthy way to not make excuses um, mm -hmm. for what I had going on. And I mean, it was incredible because although I was disabled, you know, I was just rowing with the rest of the team, just with the normal guys. Uh, yeah. Which again yeah. was very freeing. I felt like I was part of a team again and I was just, I wasn't different. I was just. Yeah. Watching the video of you, um, you know, earlier today, I was watching some college rowing videos and yeah, I mean, you look like everybody else in that boat. Um, so I was like, is this the right guy? <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, yeah. So I imagine that was, that was very freeing. And uh, then Take us to the, how did you make the leap from rowing for this collegiate program to being discovered for the national team? Yeah, it was just, it's just kind of crazy coincidence. I was on a uh, world rowing's website, watching racing videos. And, you know, I feel like at the time I was like, I kind of know all the events, you know, the quad, whatever pair. And I saw, cause at the time it was LTA, like LTA mm -hmm. mixed Cox four. And I was like, what the heck is that? You know? <laughs> um, yeah. And I kind of looked, I was like, Oh, it's para rowing. That's kind of cool. And it's interesting. So at the time, and I still live this way to a certain extent, like I don't try and let the injury define me. You know, so I'm always pushing to just redefine what it means to be living with a spinal cord injury, what it means to have nerve damage. So I never saw myself as para. Um, but just out of curiosity, I was like, oh, what is that? And I was kind of looking at like, what would classify or qualify you for it? And one of the things was uh, like permanent nerve damage from like birth defect or like traumatic injury. And like this little light bulb, I was like, hey, that's you. <laughs> that's me. Like, you know, so that was then reached out to Ellen, who was the head coach at the time and kind of sent her some scores and was like, this is my injury. Like, do you think this would classify me? And she got the ball rolling like right away. I bet she did. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, just kind of caught on. And next thing I know, I was like on the national team. It was pretty incredible. That's wild. So tell us, um, about the, the boat, the four that you're in and it, it's co-ed, right? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. And I mean, how does that, uh, I, I, I know this, these things now, but, um, you know, so can you talk to us about who's in the boat and, and how you all qualify as PR three, um, 
how does that work? And then we're going to talk about GB in a minute. Oh, uh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, totally. Um, what's great about para rowing is there's such a wide, it's very inclusive. Like there's a wide array of potential disabilities that could classify you for it. Um, so our stroke seat, I'll just go down the boat. Uh, John Tangway, he was born with club feet. Um, so through a lot of like reconstructive surgeries, uh, his pretty like weak calves and significant um, lack of range of motion in his ankles, which mm -hmm. classifies him. Me, I'm in three seat. Um, Danny in two, uh, Daniel Hansen, she was born with like herbs palsy. So she has nerve damage to her arm, which mm -hmm. classifies her. And then Allie Riley, who's bow, um, she was born, <laughs> her feet were like just I don't want to sound crass, but it's really messed up. Um, in her board, like she had like multiple extra toes and like, so a ton of surgeries were done and hardware was put in. So she has really, really stiff ankles. So she can't like, has a hard time squatting and getting to like full compression in the boat. And then that also classifies her. And then our coxswain doesn't have to be disabled. So Karen Patrick, she's just able-bodied. Okay. Okay. And do you know why it's co-ed? I love that it's co a co-ed boat. I wonder why we don't have more. Yeah. I, I love that it's co-ed also. Um, I think just for opportunity for like countries throughout the world, like it's easier mm -hmm. to find, you know, only two guys and two girls other than four right. guys and four girls. Um, so maybe as the sport grows more and more, it, they might break off and have men's and women's PR three, four. But for now, I, I think it's a pretty, pretty awesome thing. So uh, God, yeah, we, we need to talk about this. You guys have, you know, you finished in 2018, 2019, there was no 2020. Well, except for this year, which is the new 2020. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you finished silver behind, which is fantastic. Unbelievable behind team GB. Um, so I imagine that you're going in with a, with a goal to, to get ahead of them, but, but you tell us. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's this whole extra year. It's what I've been focused on. It's been the goal. Um, I mean, they're the best, like there's no two ways around it. They have consistently shown that on like the biggest mm -hmm. stages. Uh, they're incredibly fast. They're a really talented crew. Uh, but the thing about it is we are also, we're also really fast and, uh, in 2018, I definitely think it was my first worlds and just didn't quite bring it to the level I needed to. And they kind of edged us out there. And then in 2019, just through some last minute, uh, lineup switches, uh, bringing John in, we only had about two weeks before worlds, bef like of rowing together, which, you know, we just didn't mesh well as a crew. That being said, it's the same crew as 2019. We've been training really hard together and, really putting in a lot of good work and finding a lot more speed than we had in the past. So it's really exciting because, you know, if we want to beat them, we're going to have to bring our a game. And I think we're in a position to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And I should say team GB for, for those listening who don't know, that's great Britain. So, yeah. um, what, what, so this boat has been training together since 2019. Uh, kind of, unfortunately we are training center, the official Paralympic training center is CRI but we don't all train there year round. Um, so I was at the Craftsbury for a while training up there and then kind of bouncing around, trained in Oakland with the men for a little bit, um, trained down in Austin and then also trained in Princeton with the women for a little bit also. Uh, oh. yeah. So although it's the same crew, um, unfortunately we don't get to train together year round, but we have been together now for the last like month and a half. Um, so. I like how you bopped around there. Yeah. I was just kind of, did you have a favorite spot? I'm from Oakland. So I, you know, mm. little bias there. And I also, okay. it's a really good group of guys in Oakland. So that was a lot of fun. I also loved Austin though. Austin has a really cool kind of budding rowing scene, which was a lot of fun just kind of by nature. It's like tough providing resources to athletes year round in Boston. So we kind of make do with what we have in the summertime. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you've seen how we're outmatched in terms of financing, um, compared to Australia and Great Britain and, but somehow keeping up on the water. So, yeah, I mean, that's kind of, you know, it definitely, we kind of feel like we're like the ragtag kind of blue collar. We all have jobs and, you know, <laughs> trying to make it work, but yeah. Yeah. What's your job? Um, 
Right now, actually, I say that. We were I like, have, oh, <laughs> not we. You're like, some people have jobs. Have um, <laughs> <laughs> no, originally, because I graduated in 2019, I went up to Craftsbury just to fully focus on rowing, and I didn't really yeah. have to work up there. Um, post this, I'm going back to school. Uh, I'm going to Trinity College in Dublin um, to row there and get a master's there, and then after that, get a job. Wow, yeah. that's a, that's incredible. A master's in in what? Uh, comparative social change. It's in the school of sociology. Um, so yeah, it's definitely something I'm really passionate about. Yeah, great. And will you keep rowing or? Definitely, yeah, definitely have my oh, eyes. Good. It's hard to talk about 2024. When, you know, I know you don't have to answer that, right? Yet. No, but I yes. am. I definitely have my eyes set on Paris also. So it's a good combination of still getting to train and rowing for Trinity, but getting a master's degree also. Good. Okay. I had, you know, I had my other hat on there. <laughs> so you're going to be staying, right? Yeah. No, I mean, uh, yeah. Still training. Yeah. Okay. So a couple more questions for you, Charlie. One is, you know, what are you besides line? I'm guessing lining up next to Great Britain is, is one thing you're excited about, but what else are you most excited about for Tokyo? Uh, gosh, just, uh, I mean, on the surface level, like kind of the chance to see a new country and to be part of like such an incredible event. Um, but on a deeper level, I'm really excited to show people that are going through spinal cord injuries that, you, you know, the sky's the limit. Like I know your life has just been shaken up and it doesn't make sense right now, but if you give it time, like it can get better and incredible doors and opportunities can open up. And I know it's bad now, but it doesn't have to be bad forever. Yeah. Did you have people when you were 16 coming to you with that message? And then do you two part question? And then are you doing that now at all for young people? Yeah. Well, that was kind of one of the struggles actually is again, like I had no idea. I, I didn't think I was going to be kind of part of this greater community. And there was a guy on YouTube that posted videos of his recovery from uh, a lumbar like nerve damage injury. And I reached out to him a bunch and that was really great for me. And I saw how much I loved that. Um, so yeah, I try to do that now. And I've reached out to some people that have had spinal cord injuries through like physical therapists that I had mm -hmm. that then have other, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, just kind of trying to talk to them. Cause it, it doesn't make sense at the time, you know, like it, it just doesn't. Uh, and I know that there's not a ton I can say. It's kind of things you have to come to terms with and peace with on your own schedule and in your own ways. But if I can aid in that at all, and if anything, if I can be out and be like, look, no, like you can go to the Paralympics, you know, like that's what, that's what I'm really excited about. It's probably less about what you say, but who you are, right? They can look at you and see, oh, wow. Okay. He was in this situation or this position, world turned upside down and now look what he's accomplishing. So yeah, totally. It's pretty meaningful. You've been so generous with your time and, and chatting. And I always end with one with the same question. And as a um, as a big six, eight guy, I imagine uh, you're gonna have a fun answer for this, which is what's your go to meal after a row? You're coming <laughs> oh. into the dock. And someone else can make it for you. You don't need to think about getting the ingredients and, and making it. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, go to meal. There is a great cafe in Boston called Uncommon Ground. And uh, it's they make these incredible breakfast burritos. Uh, it's like they got everything, bacon, rice, beans, scrambled eggs, one of those. And then they also have, I eat a lot, um, cinnamon bun French toast, which is A1. So I get one of those and one of those. It's great. Eat out, uh, full belly, maybe, go take a nap. Perfect. Maybe that's where we'll have to meet up in Boston. Um, and then yeah. do you eat both of those things? Like, are you a double order? I'm a double. Yeah. It's the curse of being this big is you always pay a lot at restaurants. Yeah. So double order. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. I respect that. Yeah. You know, it's <laughs> got to do it. <laughs> good, good, good. Well, listen, Good luck. I don't think you need luck. You've put the work in, um, but it's always, you know, it's good to have a little luck too. I'll take it. <laughs> and we're going to all be cheering for, for you and the others in this four and just, you know, so excited to watch you all go down that course. So thanks for, for your work and representing our country and, and our sport. Yeah, no, thank you so much for having me. And it, it really is an honor. Um, so hopefully I'll do you guys proud in Tokyo. And that's all for this episode of The Swing of Things. I hope you've enjoyed hearing from some of our Paralympic athletes. 
If you enjoyed the episode, please like, share, and follow from wherever you get your podcasts. It will help others to find us. Please subscribe to make sure you don't miss it. And if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, we'd love to hear from you. Please get in touch at the swing of things at usrowing.org. Thanks for listening.